Morning, everybody. Uh, yesterday when we had class uh, uh, during Block Day on Thursday, I forgot to tell you guys that I wasn't going to be here on Friday for your class. I had a morning meeting and uh, that ran into the beginning of your guys' class. So uh, I got a little class recording for you. A couple of example problems getting into the next topic in projectile motion. Uh, but before we do that, we take a look at the calendar. Here's looking at the calendar. Um, as far as today is concerned, so here, let me use a little, some of my fancy technology here. We'll zoom in on this section right here, okay? So, and it goes off the side. But uh, today, we're going to look at a new kind of uh, problem dealing with projectile motion, that being the horizontal launch. But now we're going to look at the instantaneous velocity. So we'll see that concept-wise, we're still dealing with velocity, but like we've discussed with uh, the, all, all of projectile motion so far, the concepts don't change, but how we define those concepts and how we uh, measure those concepts in two dimensions is a little different, and that's what we're going to start today. So we'll do a couple of example problems there, a little homework for you this evening or over the weekend, uh, dealing off of that problem set, and I'll cover that later. Then... Just, I mentioned it to you in class, right? But on Monday will be your first quiz over projectile motion, horizontal launch. So all the things that we did last week, the example problems that we did in class, we did a lab that related to that horizontal launch of the projectile, uh, getting into the idea of the two dimensions being independent of one another, but occurring simultaneously. And so that is our plan for Monday open note quiz so you can use any of the problems we did in class any of the notes that you took whatever you got there to help you okay? then after the quiz on Monday we will get into the new type of problem and that is the angle launch problem so we'll talk how that's different on Monday Tuesday we'll do some more practice Wednesday we're down in the library doing virtual lab Friday uh, a example problem that sort of ties together a bunch of concepts from this chapter and then we are reviewing I have us down for review on Monday December 10th and then December 11th Tuesday not next Tuesday but the following Tuesday that's your test over projectile motion so that's what we got coming up here over the next couple of days but just to review sorry should have had this out already It's more like class this way where I have to open things up, you know, as we're doing them. So Monday, we started talking about projectile motion. We said projectile motion is objects moving in two dimensions under the influence of gravity. And we said that the important idea was that the horizontal motion is not affecting the vertical motion. Yes, they occur at the same time but they are independent of one another and that's why in the problems that we've done in class up until this point we can set up those two columns right a horizontal column and a vertical column because they're completely independent of one another we can analyze them each separately but the important idea being that because they are occurring simultaneously the time has to be the same so with that in mind I'm going to tell you an example problem from the book this is chapter 7 of the book, and if we move forward through section 7.1, we'll get to that soon enough, section 7.2 deals with projectile motion. Oh, look at that picture. Look familiar? On page 157, there is an example problem, and I am going to grab that example problem and do it for us right now. So, this is from page 157, the example problem. So it says, a stone is thrown horizontally at 15 meters per second from the top of a cliff 44 meters high. Part A, how far from the base of the cliff does the stone hit the ground? Part B, how fast is it moving the instant before it hits the ground? So, for part A, how far from the base of the cliff does the stone hit the ground? First, we're going to set ourselves up our two columns, right? We got horizontal column and we got vertical column. 
And we said that while we have these two motions occurring simultaneously, the things that we use to describe those motions remain the same. So we got VI, we've got VF, we've got A, we've got the displacement, and then we've got the time. So we said before we can do any before we do anything else, we can fill in two parts of this chart. The horizontal acceleration is always going to be zero if we neglect air resistance, which in this case we can. And the vertical acceleration is going to be 9.81 meters per second squared because gravity affects the vertical motion. Generally, we're going to call that negative 9.81 because it moves in the downward direction. So now we go to the problem and start filling some things in. First, how far from the base of the cliff does the stone hit the ground? How far is a displacement question, right? How far from the base of the cliff? That means the horizontal displacement is our unknown. Going back to the information up at the top, right? Stone is thrown horizontally at 15 meters per second. That is going to be our initial velocity in the horizontal direction. Because it says the stone is thrown horizontally, we can assume that the vertical initial velocity is zero. At the moment it became a projectile, it was only moving horizontally, not vertically. So that's why the initial vertical velocity is zero. We've already established the fact that if we have an acceleration of zero on the horizontal axis, the initial and the final velocity must be the same. Then it tells us in the problem a stone is thrown horizontally from the top of a cliff 44 meters high. That means that while that object is moving horizontally, it's also being acted on vertically by gravity, and it's moving downward. How far downward? Well, until it hits the ground. And that means that the vertical displacement is equal to 44 meters. But it's 44 meters in the negative direction. So for part A, how far from the base of the cliff does the stone hit the ground? Right? We're looking for horizontal displacement. Very similar to the problems that we did yesterday. We said that these two parts of the chart, the time horizontal and the time vertical, must be the same. Because, as we established already today, those motions occur simultaneously, meaning at the same time. So they have to be the same time. If we look at our horizontal components, we see that there are three pieces of information. But I think we've already established the fact that if you try to solve for displacement or time using these three pieces of information, you will not get an answer you're looking for. So that leaves us with the vertical components. We can figure out the time from these three vertical components. If you've been paying attention by now, you'll notice that we're kind of using the same technique over and over and over again. There is the kinematic equation that has the three pieces of information that we know, velocity initial, acceleration, and displacement, and the time that we don't know. Notice I just changed the uh, kinematic equation to delta y because now we're dealing with things on the y-axis. So I start plugging in things that I know. Because this there, there's zero in this term, this whole term goes away and becomes zero. We do a little math, and we can figure out what the time it takes for this object to get to the ground. Just doing it on my calculator here. And you should get a time of 
2.995 seconds. I realize that's too many sig digs, but because we're transferring it over, right, that means that the horizontal time is 2.995, but as we've established, if we know the vertical time, then we know the horizontal time as well. Now we have more information over here. We can solve for horizontal displacement. There's multiple ways we can do it. I think this one is the easiest in the horizontal dimension because when we start plugging in things that we know, Right? Because this acceleration term is zero, that whole term goes away, and solving for delta x is just a multiplication problem. And we end up with 44.926, two sig digs, two sig digs, 45 meters. That's part A. We've done that problem already. But now, let's talk about part B. So I'm going to take this and put it on a new page. So for part B, part B says, how fast is it moving the instant before it hits the ground? Well, if we go back to this chart, right, we can update this chart with some information that we just calculated, right? We know that the vertical dis or horizontal displacement now is 45 meters. Okay? So I'm going to take this chart <coughs> and I'm going to copy it. And I'm going to bring it over to this page. Because now that we're solving for something new, that doesn't mean that any of this information changes. But there is one thing that we haven't solved for yet, and that's V final in the vertical dimension. This question asks, how fast is it moving the instant before it hits the ground? If we were to take a time-lapse photograph of this object as it was moving, what we would find is, is that on the horizontal dimension, the ver or the horizontal velocity does not change, right? We said the acceleration horizontally is zero. So the horizontal velocity will remain exactly the same. However, in the vertical dimension, the velocity keeps increasing because gravity continues to pull on it in the downward direction as it's falling. Therefore, its downward velocity keeps increasing. So when the question says, how fast is it moving the instant before it hits the ground, you might wonder, well, does it want to know how fast it's moving horizontally? Or how fast is it moving vertically? And the answer is yes. How fast is a velocity question. But when we move into two dimensions, we have to take into account both the horizontal and the vertical velocity. Like it says here, the instantaneous velocity of an object that is moving under the influence of gravity, a projectile, the instantaneous velocity can be determined by finding the resultant of the horizontal and vertical velocities. The resultant of the horizontal and vertical velocities. So let's say we take this picture and copy it and then bring it back here and paste it here. Make it smaller. And it looks like that. So Based on the information we've had so far, we know that this cliff right here is 44 meters tall. It told us that in the problem. And we calculated in part A that this object 
travels a horizontal distance of 45 meters. It told us at the beginning of the problem that the object was thrown with an initial velocity of 15 meters per second. Oh, sorry. 15 meters per second. And we've already established that that is not going to change. Oops, sorry. When we go here or when we go here or all the way down at the bottom because the acceleration is zero. So that means that that dotted line represents a velocity of 15 meters per second. But as we just talked about, the vertical velocity keeps increasing. If this is the last picture of that stone right before it hits the ground, this red line right here is the final velocity right before it hits the ground, or the final velocity of when that object is a projectile. We know that the horizontal velocity final is 15 because it never changes. But what's the final velocity, velocity vertically? Well, we don't know that. That's the one spot on the table we haven't figured out yet. But we have enough information to figure that out. So let's do that now. If this is a question mark, that means VF in the vertical dimension can be solved if we know VI in the vertical dimension plus A in the vertical dimension times T, right? VF equals VI plus A times T. We don't know VF, but we know that VI is zero. We know the acceleration is negative 9.81, and we already established the time is 2.995. So we do our math, and we find out that V final in the vertical dimension is equal to, punch it up on my calculator here, negative 29.38. I know that's too many sig digs, but we're not done using that number. So I am going to plug it in as negative 29.38 as the final velocity. But that projectile is not moving 15 meters per second when it hits the ground. And it's not moving 29.38 meters per second when it hits the ground. It's moving the combination of those two. So how do we do the combination? Well, we add them together. But adding velocities or forces or whatever in one dimension is pretty easy. You add up all the things in one direction and you subtract the things in the other direction. But this isn't one dimension, it's two dimensions. So as it said, we're looking for the resultant, oh, we're looking for the resultant of the horizontal and vertical velocities. What does that mean? Well, when this object gets the ground, it's going 15 meters per second horizontally and 29.38 meters per second vertically. That means that the end result is something kind of like this. Because it's moving both horizontally and vertically, so it's moving at a diagonal. Okay. How are we going to find this? Your old friend trigonometry. I'm going to take this red arrow and move it this way. 29.38 goes along with it. I'm now looking for the purple arrow because that is the combination of moving 15 meters per second horizontally and 29.38 meters per second vertically. So I got to find out what the value of this arrow is. That is called finding the resultant of two perpendicular vectors. So the purple vector in this picture is the 
resultant vector of the blue one and the red one. The resultant vector is the sum of two vectors, in this case, 15 and 29.38. But it's not as simple as just adding them together. But it is as simple just as finding the hypotenuse of this right triangle. So, let me slide this up a little bit here. I'm going to use Pythagorean theorem to find the hypotenuse of this right triangle. Why do I know that it's a right triangle? Well, if I have something moving horizontally and something moving vertically, this is along the x-axis, this is along the y-axis, there has to be a right angle there in between them. I know that's a right triangle. Therefore, I can use the Pythagorean theorem and find what the resultant velocity is. Okay? So I'm just going to call this V for velocity. Using my Pythagorean theorem, right? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Which side's A, which side's B, which side's C? C always has to be the hypotenuse, right? It doesn't matter which side you call A and B, but C always has to be the hypotenuse. So I'm going to call A the 15 side, so 15 squared plus... twenty nine point three eight squared has to equal v squared so I run that through my period or I run that through my calculator and find out what v is don't forget you want v not v squared When I run that through my calculator, I get 32.9876 meters per second. Okay. Now, let's see if that makes sense. It's a right triangle. So what do you know about the hypotenuse of a right triangle? It always has to be the longest side of the right triangle. And in this case, that turns out to be true. We do some rounding significant digits, and we end up with 33 meters per second. That's how fast, that's how fast that object is moving the instant before it hits the ground. It's the resultant vector of the horizontal velocity, horizontal final velocity, and the vertical final velocity. When an object is moving in two dimensions, we can find the instantaneous velocity as the resultant of the horizontal and vertical. In these pictures here, right, that would be diagonals between these two velocities. But what we find out is If we looked at the horizontal and vertical velocities individually, we would see that the horizontal velocities remain exactly the same the entire time. But the vertical velocities keep increasing. The result of that is that we keep getting a bigger resultant velocity, which happens to be the hypotenuse of the right triangle formed by those two velocities. So that's how you find instantaneous velocity. For practice, I would like you to work on a couple of problems for me. 
On page 158, on page 158, right in the middle of the page, problem number 9 and problem number 10. Problem number 9, A and B are similar to the, pro or the problems that we've done in the last in the last section, horizontal launch. But letter C starts getting into looking at the resultant. Okay, It's asking you for the vertical components just before it hits the ground, but you can figure out the resultant. So on page 158, number 9 and number 10, also on this page that we started working on, this problem set that I gave you, um, that I gave you, on Monday, two problems that are similar to the one that we just did. First, problem number one. So from that problem set, problem number one. And then also from that problem set, problem number four. Problem number four, similar to what we just did. So, for the remainder of the period, I would like you to work on those problems together. If you're one of the people that gets it, help other people. If you're not getting it, find somebody who is getting it. I can entertain questions at the beginning of class. Oh, these problems that are shown up here. Answers to those problems are available online. So if we go back to the calendar picture, right? For Friday's homework, ooh, that was terrible. Not good again. Disappearing ink, though, so it'll go away in a second. All right, let me try and do this box again. If you look on Friday's homework, there's a um, link, Answers to Projectile Motion Horizontal Launch Worksheet. You'll find the answers to problem number one and problem number two, but also problem number four, which I've asked you to work on for the remainder of the period. So work on those practice problems. Do the homework that's assigned for this evening. And uh, I will entertain questions on Monday. Then you'll have your quiz. Have a good weekend, everybody. See you on Monday.